So we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. Let's go back to about a month after Ray opened his McDonald's. May 1955 saw Harry Sonneborn come into the fold. He had recently resigned as vice president of finance for Tasty Freeze, which Harry had ordered multi-mixers from Ray before while working at Tasty Freeze. He noticed how Ray had a good thing going with his McDonald's and called Ray wanting to be a part of it. Ray knew that he needed help franchising McDonald's, but he was spread thin and he knew he couldn't afford anybody. Regardless, Harry met Ray in Ray's office. Harry, 39 years old at the time, walked in standing at 6 feet tall, lanky, but disciplined and serious. As they discussed the high risks of franchising on a larger scale, Ray told Harry at the end of the meeting that he couldn't afford to hire him. Harry then said he'll figure out the lowest amount he could take as a salary to support his family and bring it to Ray, hoping to be hired. When Harry came back, he told Ray he could work for $100 a week. Harry was hired on the spot as executive. With his knowledge of the ins and outs of everything legal and financial, he became a valuable asset to McDonald's. Ray looked at McDonald's as a family-friendly place, so he made sure franchises would not have payphones, jukeboxes, or vending machines, which would create an environment where people would hang out longer than it would take for them to eat their meals and leave. By the end of 1955, Kroc opened two more McDonald's locations, which grossed $235,000 in sales. At every location, Ray used the McDonald Brothers format and also used the motto, If you have time to lean, you have time to clean, to all of his workers, including himself, to make sure the restaurants were cleaned spotlessly. 1956, eight McDonald's restaurants were opened, and Ray wanted the franchise to be more than just a name that all kinds of different people used. He wanted to make sure that every McDonald's was the same. So basically, a McDonald's in Chicago would have the same exact food and appearance as it would in New York City or in Santa Claus, Indiana. Ray realized that he had to make a development business where all the McDonald's would be under one marketing program nationwide. But for all of that to happen, hiring people to supervise and make sure each store operated smoothly, took money. So the solution for the money problem and to get this ball rolling, it was all thought up by Harry Sonneborn with the Franchise Realty Corporation. It was designed only to hold McDonald's real estate. And this company signed leases and mortgages for the land and buildings, passing the cost onto the franchisee with a 20 to 40% markup. And with this, they lowered the franchise fee to $950. Franchise Realty started with $1,000 up front, and Harry turned it into $170 million worth of real estate. This became the biggest decision financially in McDonald's history, which has made the restaurant to be as big as it is, as this same model is still in place today. So as this happened, Ray, Harry, and the Secretary June worked like crazy around the clock in these early years, feeding this baby of a restaurant to grow into the giant that it was destined to become. With Franchise Realty up and running, needing someone that could handle corporate operations, Ray thought back to a 23-year-old Fred Turner. Fred was part of a family group wanting to be a franchisee, and while Fred was waiting for his family group to figure out where they'd want to put their McDonald's, Fred took up Ray's offer to learn how McDonald's operated at Ray's Des Plaines store. Right away, Fred was a natural leader, making sure all things clicked in the store. When the family group fell through and a franchise store wasn't built, Fred was then sent to be a manager at the McDonald's in Chicago. And as soon as McDonald's needed somebody to handle operations, Fred was pulled by Ray to work for his newly appointed position. January 1957, Fred Turner started work on operations of all McDonald's stores for $475 a month. And throughout this time, Ray and Harry were butting heads a lot, but both still shared the same dream of making McDonald's huge. Harry, the more scholar and analytical, and Ray, the more enthusiastic and people-pleasing type, 
June Martino, the secretary, had to be the cushion between the two to keep McDonald's from imploding. Meanwhile, Fred Turner had figured out the best shape and size of the hamburger patty. One tenth of a pound, 19% fat content, all beef and no fillers. By 1958, there were 34 McDonald's restaurants, and Fred Turner was handling all of the food and supply purchasing for McDonald's. 1959, the first McDonald's location in Hawaii opens up in Honolulu. Harry Sonneborn became the president and CEO of McDonald's, and also they ran into trouble as one man planning to be a franchisee started building McDonald's stores on land he didn't have the titles for. There's not much more info on the man and what happened to him, but Ray, who at the time had a net worth of $90,000, was having to borrow $400,000 to pay the mess left behind from this man. So after this $400,000 ordeal, Ray got the idea to build 10 McDonald's stores ran strictly by the company, and through Sonneborn, three insurance companies came forward to lend $1.5 million. This lended money was in exchange for 22.5% of McDonald's stock. The money from these insurance companies made McDonald's grow like wildfire, and it gave the McDonald brothers back in California a nice chunk of change. In 1960, the first company store was opened in Columbus, Ohio. Ray wanted to bring in new ideas to further grow McDonald's, but due to his contract, he had to get any changes that he wanted done approved by the McDonald brothers. Ray was curious to see how the McDonald stores in California were running, so he sent Fred Turner to check it out. Fred came back to report that the original San Bernardino location was the only real legit McDonald's. The other locations had the burgers and fries, but along with it they were serving pizza, and another one was serving burritos and enchiladas. The problem with this was all these extra menu items drug the quality of the hamburgers down, which in turn gave the other McDonald's restaurants a bad image. Ray brought it up to the brothers, but the brothers just brushed it off and really just didn't care. Ray wanted to be in control of all the McDonald's and the McDonald's brand. He was mad, but he couldn't do anything about it, so at the moment he just had to deal with it. August 30th, 1960, the 200th McDonald's location was opened in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the first Alaska McDonald's location opens in the city of Juneau. In 1961, in Minneapolis, Ray was having a dinner with a new franchisee, and Ray met a married woman who was playing the organ. This was Joni Smith, and he fell in love right away. And small world, because it just so happened that the franchisee was hiring Joni Smith's husband as the manager for his new McDonald's restaurant. Now Ray being a married man, going to see the McDonald's in Minneapolis was a great excuse to see Joni. When Ray would visit Minneapolis, he'd make small talk with Joni, he'd play piano as she'd play organ, doing duets, and they'd spend a lot of time talking on the phone, long conversations at night as Ray would tell Joni all of his big dreams about McDonald's and what the future could hold. During one of these long phone conversations, Ray proposed to Joni that they both should divorce from their significant others and get married. As Joan and Ray both felt the same way about each other, Ray put the ball in Joan's court and divorced Ethel right away. Through divorcing Ethel, Ray wound up giving Ethel the house, the car, all of the insurance, and $30,000 a year for life. The only thing that Ray kept was his share of McDonald's. To pay for all of the legal fees through the divorce, Ray wound up selling Prince Castle sales for $150,000. Ray saw this as a small price to pay to be able to marry Joan and finally be happy. When Ray told Joan the news, Joan was happy, but... Joan hit Ray with the bad news that she didn't divorce her husband and she needed more time to think about it. So Ray, with a change of plans of not marrying Joan right away, he focused all of his time into McDonald's even more. With Mac McDonald's health declining and Dick McDonald wanting to retire, 
Ray was now determined more than ever, and he was also tired of always having to go through the McDonald brothers for approval of anything at all. So Ray asked the brothers how much it would cost to buy them out completely. The brothers came up with a figure of $2.7 million in cash only. The brothers came up with this figure because $2.7 million meant both brothers would get a million dollars each in cash after taxes. The obvious problem with this was that Ray didn't have $2.7 million in cash, so he asked the brothers to finance instead, but the brothers were adamant about the $2.7 million in cash only. So Ray needing cash to buy out the McDonald brothers, and the insurance companies that they got money from previously being tapped out, Ray and Harry found John Bristol. He was a financial advisor to various colleges and institutions, and that led them to get the money. So from 12 educational and other kinds of institutions, from Princeton University to Howard University to even the Ford Foundation, Ray got the $2.7 million to pay off the McDonald brothers and to be the sole owner of McDonald's. After the deal was done, Ray had the thought that the original San Bernardino location was his as well. The brothers went back on their deal, which was through a handshake agreement, and wound up keeping their original restaurant. Ray wanted this spot because it was a very popular spot and it drew a lot of money. It was a great location. And to not have it after paying the brothers off and owning the McDonald's brand, it got to him. Ray Kroc not usually being a vengeful man, he went to the brothers and made it aware that he owned the name McDonald's. And the brothers were legally made to change the name of their restaurant, McDonald's, to the Big M instead. With Ray Kroc now completely owning McDonald's, the overall image of the restaurants kept some original things and brought in some new things as well. The early McDonald's mascot, Speedy, with the hamburger head, was cut, and a new McDonald's logo featuring the golden arches was brought in. On the business side of things, Ray made it to where a franchisee could only own one store at a time. This was done so no one owned one whole territory and gave Ray Kroc more control over McDonald's altogether. Ray also sold all the supplies to the restaurants at a decent price and made sure that every franchise was making a decent profit. So jumping out of the business side of things and back into Ray's personal life, later on in 1961, Joni called Ray after she thought it over and she gave him the news that she couldn't go through with divorcing her husband. So after this, Ray packed his bags and he left Chicago for California. The first couple years in California for Ray were lonely, and he spent a lot of time in his house just filling it up with a bunch of stuff. It was at this point that he saw reports of the McDonald's stores and he noticed that Joni and her husband opened their own McDonald's in Rapid City, South Dakota. Now bouncing back into the business side of things in Ray's life, which he had plenty to keep his mind occupied, as there was a franchisee in Cincinnati who was having problems selling on Fridays, as the city had a huge population of Catholics who at the time couldn't eat meat on Fridays. The competing restaurant in town, Big Boy, had a fish sandwich on Fridays that got all of the business. So this franchisee mentioned that they should also serve a fish sandwich at McDonald's. Ray didn't like this idea at first, but he was okay with it after he was able to settle with what kind of fish would be served. And after an employee added a slice of cheese to the sandwich, it just set it off completely, and Ray gave this fish sandwich the green light to be served. And Ray named this sandwich the filet fish So Ray looking at this idea of having a sandwich with no meat in it, he wanted to give the filet fish some friendly competition. So Ray came up with the hula burger. And the hula burger was a piece of grilled pineapple with two slices of cheese on a bun. So starting on Good Friday in 1962 in select locations, the hula burger and the filet fish were put on the menu. The results from the sales of the hula burger and the filet fish on Good Friday were filet fish 350 to the hula burger at just six. 
Needless to say, the Hula Burger was taken off the menu shortly after. Also in 1962, just to stick it to the McDonald brothers, Ray Kroc built a McDonald's just a block away from their restaurant, The Big M. 1963, Ray fell in love with a woman by the name of Jane Green. She was a really sweet and kind woman who also worked as the secretary for the movie star John Wayne. Jane and Ray would go on dates to the point where it was almost every night, till just after two weeks of dating, they got married. 1963 also saw the new McDonald's mascot, in which he came in the form of a clown named Ronald McDonald, the Hamburger Happy Clown. He's known all around the world with bright red hair, wearing a yellow jumpsuit and red and white striped clothes underneath, and wearing big red clown shoes. He first appeared in three TV commercials, and his appearance in these early years were much different than now. The first incarnation had Ronald with mangy hair, wearing a tray of food on top of his head like a hat, and the face makeup was about the same with the red and white. These first commercials would be about Ronald McDonald bumping into kids and all of them going to McDonald's, as each of these commercials would end with Ronald McDonald skipping and jumping with cheerful music playing in the background. The origin story of Ronald McDonald is mildly disputed, as McDonald's never flat out said who created the character, but most evidence points to the man who first played Ronald McDonald, Willard Scott. Willard Scott played as Bozo the Clown on television from 1959 to 1962. Bozo the Clown was extremely popular at the time, and when Scott was done being Bozo in 1963, he claimed that McDonald's contacted him requesting to play as a hamburger happy clown in three television commercials. The original Ronald McDonald look would last until 1966 when McDonald's hired circus performer Coco the Clown to redesign Ronald McDonald's image to his classic look that people see today. In 1965, Ray Kroc made himself president of McDonald's. Ray started expanding on McDonald's restaurants, focusing on opening new restaurants in the suburbs of large cities, close to where the majority of most people lived. In April 1965, McDonald's was getting huge, but as money came in, it kept going back out to feed the growth, and not much money for extra costs for other endeavors. So this was the factor into why they went public, selling shares of the company at $22.50 apiece. And also in 1965, this is when McDonald's switched from having employees cut potatoes to make french fries, to using frozen french fries instead. And by the end of 1965, McDonald's had 700 restaurants in 44 states. And on Thanksgiving 1966, during the Macy's Day Parade, the new redesigned Ronald McDonald makes his television debut on the McDonald's float, featuring the McDonald's All-American Band. By the end of 1966, McDonald's saw Harry Sonneborn and Ray Kroc coming to a head as Harry was having health problems and he was spending more time away from the office and more time with his wife in Alabama. Ray was wanting to keep pushing McDonald's and expand it even further than it already was. But Harry had other plans after talking to other financial buddies and he thought a recession in the coming year would doom the company. So Harry put a suspension on all existing plans of constructing new McDonald's stores. 